Welcome back to Doc Saying Stuff. We really appreciate you guys being here. Thanks for all the comments and feedback. And I remember in college, after I began spending long hours studying, I started not to be able to see far away. I wanted to know why. We got a lot of questions on ophthalmology in general. So let's bring in our expert, Dr. Rupa Wong. Dr. Wong, I have like an overview question about how the eye even works. Basically, the eye is pretty amazing and this is how it works. I've got my little eye model here. First, the light travels through this, which is the cornea. It's the clear dome-shaped covering of the eye and it gets bent a little bit at that point by the cornea itself. Next, it goes to the lens, which really has a lot of the focusing power of the eye. If it's cloudy, that's called a cataract. It's important that the lens then focuses the light even more. So ultimately, it can end on the retina. Once the image is on the retina, the optic nerve takes it and transmits it to the brain. Now, Dr. Wong, I wear glasses, I wear contacts. I'm nearsighted and the way I think about it is because I can see near but not far, but can you explain this in more professional terms? Nearsightedness is also called myopia and there are a couple different reasons to have it. You can have an issue, which is a little less common, where the cornea is the cause for the nearsightedness, but typically the most common cause of nearsightedness is axial myopia, when the eyeball is just a little too long. We can actually measure how long the eyeball is and what's happening is that the image that's getting transferred, all the light rays, is focusing in front of the retina instead of on the retina because the eyeball is too long. What are the top three symptoms of nearsightedness? So the top three symptoms of myopia or nearsightedness, first one, blurry vision, especially for distance objects. In addition, you might notice that you need to squint and when you do squint, it helps the vision. The reason for that is you're decreasing the aperture, the amount of light that's entering your eye and it helps bend it in a certain way that focuses it on the retina. And then the third symptom is eye strain. All that squinting, all that blurry vision can cause a lot of eye strain. How do you approach children? That's the thing with babies. It's hard because they don't, obviously they're not going to talk to you. They're not going to tell you if you're nearsighted. And even kids who are verbal, they don't know what they're supposed to see. So they're not going to come to their parents or to the pediatrician saying, I have blurred vision. So first babies, that's actually why it's really important when they come in to see a pediatric ophthalmologist, we check the retinas and we dilate the pupils. And then I use something called a retinoscope where I can check the refraction of the eye using all different powers of lenses. So I can actually tell if a baby is nearsighted, farsighted, or right where they should be. Now, basically anyone knows that if you have nearsightedness, this can be corrected with lenses. Either those are glasses or contacts, but how exactly does that work? So right now we've got a lot of different ways to correct nearsightedness, and this is where things are interesting. There's the traditional glasses and contact lenses. And what they do is they use a minus lens to be able to push the image back so that it focuses on the retina instead of in front of the retina where it would naturally happen. So both glasses and contact lenses work the same in that way. Now there are also different ways to help slow the worsening of nearsightedness in kids. You know, 10 years ago, we didn't have any of these treatment options. So it's pretty amazing to be able to practice in this day and age. So one of them is low dose atropine. It's not something that's available at your regular pharmacy. It has to be specially mixed by a compounding pharmacy. And that's been shown in several studies to slow the worsening of nearsightedness. And then there are all other types of glasses and contact lenses that are specific and special at being able to slow um, the nearsightedness down because they allow for a dual focus in the way that the contact lens is made. When we think about nearsightedness or people who have a visual impairment, I know that there are other things you can do besides wear glasses. I've heard of LASIK. I've heard of um, other things. I've actually considered having LASIK. What are those options and how does LASIK actually work? There are a couple different surgical options for nearsightedness. Most people know about LASIK, which is the laser that cuts the cornea and then applies the laser and then you put the flap back down. 
There's also PRK, proto-refractive keratectomy, which is very similar to LASIK, except we don't use a laser to cut the flap of the cornea. We just abrade the corneal epithelium down and then apply the laser. So the healing time is a little bit longer for PRK. My be better though for certain individuals who have thinner corneas. And then there are two newer options actually for people with nearsightedness. One is called SMILE, which is small incision lenticular extraction. And they remove and reshape the cornea by just removing little pieces of it. So it's a little bit different than LASIK and it allows the cornea to change shape so that the light is focused on the retina the way it should be. Another one is a surgical procedure in which it's called implantable columnar lens in which this special lens is put in your eye behind the iris, which is the colored part of your eye, but in front of the lens. You know, we had a lot of parents who probably watched the show. My question is, are there dangerous medical issues that happen in the brain that can present as nearsightedness? Tumors? Is it a sign of seizures? Is it a sign of brain inflammation? So brain tumors can present as blurry vision, but typically they will present as double vision or even loss of peripheral vision. It's hard to know if you're an individual experiencing the blurred vision, if it's farsightedness blurry vision or nearsightedness blurry vision. So in any event, if you're experiencing any kind of change, in your vision, you should just come in to see us. So we're happy to be able to do all of the tests, especially if you're having a history of headaches or nausea and vomiting. But again, just because you have a sudden change in your vision doesn't mean it's always going to be a brain tumor. Dr. Wong, what is one big thing that you want everyone to know about nearsightedness? A lot of things come with being nearsighted, especially highly nearsighted. If you are over a minus 6.00, then you're a, a whole different risk category of things that can cause blindness, even if you've had surgery to fix the nearsightedness. This is why it's really important, even after LASIK, PRK, whatever surgery you've had, to keep those annual eye exams with your ophthalmologist so we can examine the retina and make sure there are no issues. Thank you for tuning in to Dr. Saying Stuff, the place where we do a deep dive into common medical questions like, what is nearsightedness? So like, subscribe, comment, share, do all the things, and we will see you next time.